Instruction of the Queen of Heaven, Most Blessed Mary. Take notice, then, my daughter, that the example of these events of my life should serve thee for thy instruction and direction. Treasure up this example lovingly in thy bosom, and allow it to dilate thy heart, so as to receive with joy the persecutions and calumnies of creatures, whenever thou art made partaker of such happiness. The sons of perdition, who serve vanity, are ignorant of the treasure of suffering, injuries, and of pardoning them, and they make a boast of vengeance, which even according to the requirements of natural reason is reprehensible and arises from a heart brutal and beastly rather than from a human. On the other hand, he who pardons injuries magnanimously and forgets them, although he may not have divine faith nor the light of the gospel, becomes noble and excellent and does not pay vile tribute to the fierce and irrational brutality of revenge. And if the vice of revenge is so contrary even to the dictates of nature, consider, my daughter, how much it is opposed to grace, and how hateful and abominable the vengeful are in the eyes of my most holy Son, who made himself man, suffered and died for no other purpose than to forgive and to obtain the pardon of the Almighty for the injuries committed by the human race. Against this tendency of his whole life, and against his whole nature and infinite bounty, vengeance is arrayed. As far as in him lies, the vindictive man destroys entirely, as well, God himself, as all his works. And for this attempt he well merits that God should destroy him with all, all his might. Between the person who pardons and suffers injuries and the vindictive, there is the same difference as between the one and only heir and the deadly enemy. This one provokes all the wrath of God, and the other merits and obtains all blessings, because in this virtue he exhibits a most perfect image of the Celestial Father. I wish thee, O soul, to understand that to suffer injuries with equanimity and to pardon them entirely for the Lord will be more acceptable in his eyes than if thou choose of thy own will to do the most severe penance and shed thy own blood for him. Humble thyself before those who persecute thee. Love them and pray for them for, the, for thy true heart. Thereby shalt thou turn toward thee and love the heart of thy God and rise to the perfection of holiness, and thou shalt overcome hell in all things. That great dragon who persecutes all men was confounded many times by my humility and meekness, and his fury could not tolerate the sight of these virtues. From them he fled more swiftly than the sun's rays. I gained great victories for my soul and won glorious triumphs for the exaltation of the divinity. When any creature rose up against me, I conceived no anger toward it, for I knew in reality it was an instrument of the Most High, directed by his providence for my special good. This knowledge and the consideration that it was a creature of my Lord capable of grace excited me to love it truly with a greater fervor, and I did not rest until I could reward this benefit of persecution by obtaining for it eternal life as far as was possible. Strive after, therefore, and labor for the imitation of that which thou hast understood and written. Show thyself most meek, peaceful, and agreeable toward those who molest thee. Esteem them truly in thy heart, and do not take vengeance of thy Lord by taking vengeance on his instruments, nor despise the inestimable jewels of, jewel of injuries. As far as lies in thee, always good, give good for evil, Romans 12.14, benefits for injuries, love for hate, praise for blame, blessings for malediction. Then wilt thou be a perfect daughter of thy father, Matthew 5.43 the beloved spouse of thy Lord, my friend and my most cherished daughter. <coughs> the Most High enlightens the priest concerning the spotless innocence of Most Holy Mary. She herself is informed of the approaching death of her mother, St. Anne, and is present at this event. The Lord did not sleep, nor did he slumber. Psalm 124, one twenty, the number 120. 120 and the number four during the clamors of his beloved spouse mary although he pretended not to hear them delighting in the prolonged exercise of her sufferings which occasion occasioned so many glorious triumphs and the admirations and praises of the supernal spirits <coughs> the smoldering fire of the persecution already mentioned continued unabated in order that the phoenix mary might many times renew herself from the ashes of her humility and in order that her most pure heart be regenerated over and over again to new estates and conditions of divine grace. But when the opportune time arrived for putting an end to the blind envy and jealousy of those ensnared maidens, and in order that, the, that their petulance might not altogether discredit her, who was to be the excellence of nature and grace itself, the Lord spoke to the priest in his sleep and said to him, quote, 
My servant Mary is pleasing in my eyes, and she is my perfect and my chosen one. She is entirely innocent of anything of which she is accused. Unquote. The same revelation was given to Anne, the instructress of the maidens. That morning the priest and the instructress conferred with each other about the message with both, which both had received. Being now certain, they repented of the deceit into which they had been led and called the Princess Mary, asking her pardon for having given credit to the false report of the girls and offering her all the reparation necessary to defend her from the persecution and sufferings consequent upon it. She that was the mother and origin of humility, after listening to their words, answered the priest and the instructress, quote, My superiors, I am the one that deserves your reprehens reprehensions, and I beseech you, do not hold me unworthy of undergoing them, since I ask for them as most necessary to me. The intercourse with my sisters, the other maidens, is most highly prized by me, and I do not wish to be deprived of it through my fault, since I owe them so much for having borne with me. And as a return for that benefit, I desire to serve them more faithfully. Nevertheless, if you command me anything else, I stand prepared to obey your will. Unquote. And this answer of the Most Holy Mary still more comforted and consoled the priest and the instructress, and they approved of her, her humble petition. But from that time on, they attended to her and observed her with new reverence and affection. The Most Humble Maiden begged to kiss the hand of the priest and of the matron, asking for their blessing according to their, her custom. With this they dismissed her, just as the parched desire of the thirsty for drink is increased at the sight of clear water withdrawn beyond their reach, so was the heart of Mary our mistress filled with yearning regret for the exercise of suffering. Thirsting and burning for the divine love she feared lest through the watchful care of the priest and of the instructress she should suffer from thenceforward to be deprived of the treasure of affliction. Seeking solitude and speaking with God alone she addressed him, quote, why, O Lord and most beloved Master, such severity with me? Why such a long absence and such a forgetfulness of her who cannot live without thee? And if in the protracted solitude and separation from thy sweet and loving presence I was consoled by the pledges of thy affection given to me in the afflictions and sufferings for thy sake, how shall I be able to live now in my dereliction without this solace? Why, O Lord, dost thou so soon withdraw thy benefit, beneficent hand from me in refusing me this favor? Who besides thyself could have changed the sentiments of the priests and of the instructress? But I do not merit the benefit of their charitable reprehensions, nor am I worthy to bear affliction, for I am equally unworthy of thy most loving visit and delightful presence. If I have not been able to please thee, my Father and Lord, I will make amends for my negligence. There can be no relief from the depression of my spirit as long as the joy of thy presence is wanting to my soul. But I continue to hope that thy divine pleasure, O my spouse, be fulfilled in all things. Unquote. The enlightenment of the priest and the instructress concerning Mary abated the persecutions of the maidens. The Lord also restrained them and prevented the demon from inciting them thereafter. But the time during which he absented himself and during which he hid himself from this heavenly spouse lasted, wonderful to relate, ten years. Although the Most High interrupted this absence a few times by allowing the veil to fall from his face for the relief of his beloved, but it was not often that he dispensed this favor during that time, and he did it with less lavishness and tenderness than in the first years of her childhood. This absence of the Lord was ordained for our Queen in order that she might, by actual exercise of all perfection, be made worthy for the dignity to which she was destined by the Most High. For if she had continually enjoyed the vision of his majesty in the manner described by us in the fourteenth chapter of this book, she could not have suffered according to the common order of a mere creature. But during this retirement and absence of the Lord, although Most Holy Mary missed the intuitive and abstractive visions of the divine essence and of the angels as mentioned above, her Most Holy Soul and her faculties enjoyed more gifts of grace and more supernatural enlightenment than all the saints ever attained or received. For in regard to this, the hand of God never withdrew from her. But in comparison with the frequent visitations of the Lord in her first years, I call the state of her privation of his presence for such a long time an absence and withdrawal of the Lord. It commenced eight days before the death of her father, St. Joachim, and afterwards the persecution of hell began, followed by the persecutions on the part of creatures. They lasted until our princess reached the age of twelve years. Having passed this age, the holy angels on a certain day, without manifesting themselves, spoke to her as follows, quote, Mary, the end of the life of thy holy mother Anne 
as ordained by the Most High, is now about to arrive, and His Majesty has resolved to free her from the prison of her mortal body and bring her labors to a happy fulfillment." Unquote. At this unexpected and sorrowful message, the heart of the affectionate daughter was filled with compassion. Prostrating herself in the presence of the Most High, she poured forth a fervent prayer for the happy death of her mother, St. Anne, in the following words, quote, King of the ages, invisible and eternal Lord, immortal and almighty creator of the universe, although I am but dust and ashes, and although I must confess that I am in debt to thy greatness, I will not on that account be prevented from speaking to my Lord, Genesis 18:17. And I pour out before thee my heart, hoping, O oh my God, that thou wilt not despise her who has always confessed thy holy name. Dismiss, O oh Lord, in peace thy servant, who has with invincible faith and confidence desired to fulfill thy divine pleasure. Let her issue victoriously and triumphantly from the hostile combat and enter the portal of thy holy chosen ones. Let thy powerful arm strengthen her at the close of her mortal career. Let the same that same right hand which has helped her to walk in the path of perfection assist her and let her enter O oh my father into the peace of thy friendship and grace since she has always sought after it with an upright heart unquote. the lord did not respond expressly in words to this petition of his beloved but his answer was a marvelous favor shown to her and to her mother saint anne during that night his majesty commanded the guardian angels of the most holy mary to carry her bodily to the sick bed of her mother and one of them to remain in her stead, assuming for this purpose an aerial body as a substitute for hers. The holy angels obeyed the mandate of God, <coughs> and they carried their, their and our queen to the house and to the room of her holy mother Anne. Being thus brought to the presence of her mother, the heavenly lady kissed her hand and said to her, quote, My mother and mistress, may the Most High be thy light and thy strength, and may he be blessed, since he has in his condescension not permitted me in my necessity to remain without the benefit of thy last blessing. May I then receive it, my mother, from thy hand." Unquote. Holy Anne gave her last blessing to Mary, and with overflowing heart also thanked the Lord for the great favor thus conferred upon herself, for she knew the sacrament of her daughter and queen, and she did not forget to express her gratitude for the love which Mary had shown her on this occasion. Then our princess turned toward her mother and comforted her against the approach of death, and among many other words of incomparable consolation, she spoke also the following, quote, Mother, beloved of my soul, it is necessary that we pass through the portal of death to the eternal life which, was, which we expect. Bitter and painful is the passage, but also profitable, for it, is an in, for it is instituted by the divine goodness as the beginning of our security and rest. <clears throat> It satisfies by itself for the negligences and shortcomings of the creature in fulfilling the duties. Except death, O oh my mother, though it pay the common debt of joy with joy of spirit, and departing confidence to the company of the holy patriarchs, prophets, the just and the friends of God, who were our ancestors, there await them, with them the beatitude which the Most High will send to us through our Savior and His redemption. The certainty of this hope will be thy consolation until we attain to the full possession of that which we expect." St. Anne answered her daughter with a return of love and in a spirit of joy worthy of herself and of such a daughter on such an occasion. In maternal tenderness she said, quote, Mary, my beloved daughter, fulfill now thy obligation by not forgetting me in the presence of our Lord God and Creator and reminding him of the need I have of his protection in this hour. Remember what thou owest to her who has conceived thee and bore thee in her womb nine months, who afterwards nourished thee in her breast and has always held thee in her heart. Beseech the Lord, my daughter, that he extend a hand of mercy toward me, his useless creature, who has her beginning only through his mercies, and that I may receive his blessing in this hour of my death, for I place my confidence and have always placed it altogether in his holy name. Do not leave me, my beloved, before thou hast closed my eyes. Thou wilt be left an orphan and without the protection of man, but thou wilt live under the guardianship of the Most High. Confide in the mercies which he has shown of old. Daughter of my heart, walk in the path of the justifications of the Lord, and ask his majesty to govern thy aspirations and, and thy powers, and to be thy teacher in the holy law. Do not leave the temple before choosing thy state of life, 
and let it be done only with the choosing only with the sound advice of the priests of the temple, and continue to pray to the Lord that he dispose of thy affairs according to his own pleasure. Pray that, if it be his will, to give thee a spouse, he may be of the tribe of Judah and of the race of David. The possessions of thy father Joachim and of myself, which shall belong to thee, share with the poor, with whom thou shouldest deal in loving generosity. Keep thy secret hidden within thy bosom, and ask the Omnipotent without ceasing to show his mercy by sending his salvation and redemption through his promised Messiah. Ask and beseech his infinite bounty to be thy protection, and may his blessing come over thee together with mine. Unquote. In the midst of such exalted and heavenly colloquies, the Blessed Mother St. Anne felt the throes of death approaching and reclining upon the throne of grace, that is, in the arms of her most holy daughter Mary, she rendered her, mo her most pure soul to her Creator, Having closed the eyes of her mother, as St. Anne had requested, and leaving the sacred body in position for burial, the Queen Mary was again taken up by the holy angels and restored to her place in the temple. The Most High did not impede the force of her filial love, which naturally would cause a great and tender sorrow at the death of her mother, and a sense of loneliness at being deprived of her assistance. But these sorrows were most holy and perfect in our queen, governed by the graces of her most prudent innocence and purity. In the midst of them she gave praise to the Most High for the infinite mercies which she had shown to her mother, both in life and in death, while her sweet and loving complaints on account of the absence of the Lord continued unabated. However, this most holy daughter could not know the full extent of the consolation afforded her mother in having her present at her death. For the daughter was not aware of her own exalted dignity in the sacrament connected with her, as was known to the mother. This she had always kept secret, as the mother, as the Most High had commanded her, but finding at her bedside her, who was the light of her eyes and of the whole world, and having the privilege of expiring in her arms, all the desires of her mortal life were fulfilled, making its end more happy than that of all the mortals up to that hour. She died not so much in the fullness of years as in the fullness of merits, and her most holy soul was placed by the angels in the bosom of Abraham, where she was recognized and reverenced by all the patriarchs, prophets, and the just who were in that place. This most holy matron was naturally endowed with a great and generous heart, with a clear and aspiring intellect, fervent and at the same time full of tranquility and peace. She was of medium stature, somewhat similar than, somewhat smaller than her daughter, most Holy Mary. Her face was rather round to, of a suffused whiteness. Her countenance was always equable and composed, and finally she was the mother of her who was to be the mother of God himself. This dignity in itself included many perfections. St. Anne lived 56 years, portioned off into the following periods. At the age of 24, she espoused St. Joachim, and she remained without issue for 20 years. Then in the forty-fifth year she gave birth to the Most Holy Mary, and of the twelve years which she lived during the lifetime of Mary, three were passed in her company, and nine during her absence in the temple, which altogether makes fifty-six years. Concerning this great and admirable woman, as I have been informed, some, gave auth some grave authors assert that St. Anne was married three times, and that in each one of these marriages she was the mother of one of the three Marys. Others have the contrary opinion. The Lord has vouchsafed to me solely on account of his goodness and great uh, solely on account of his goodness great enlightenment concerning the life of this fortunate saint yet never was it intimated to me that she was ever married except to Saint Joachim or that she ever had any other daughter besides Mary the mother of Christ perhaps it does not pertain to nor was necessary for the history which I am writing information was not given to me whether the other Marys who are called her sisters were or were not her cousins that is, daughters of the sister of St. Anne. When her spouse, St. Joachim, died, she was in the forty-eighth year of her age, and the Most High selected and set her apart from the race of women, in order to make her the mother of her, who was the superior of all creatures, inferior only to God, and yet his mother, and yet his mother. Because of her having such a daughter, and of her being the grandmother of the Word made man, all the nations may call the most fortunate St. Anne blessed. Instruction by the Most Holy Queen Mary My daughter, the most valuable science of man is to know how to resign himself entirely into the hands of his Creator, since he knows why he has formed him and for what end each man is destined. Man's sole duty is to live in obedience and in the love of his Lord. 
God will charge himself most solicitously with the care of those that thus confide in him. He will take upon himself the management of all the affairs and all the events of this life in order to draw blessings and benefits for those that thus trust in his fidelity. <clears throat> he afflicts and corrects the just by adversities. He consoles and rejoices them with his favors. He inspires them with hope in his promises and threatens them and inspires them with fear by his threats. He, absent, he absents himself, absents himself in order to attract their love. He shows himself to the souls in order to reward and preserve them in fervor. And in all these things, he makes the lives of the chosen ones more delightful and beautiful. All this happened to me in that which thou hast written of me. He visited me and prepared me in his mercy with many different kinds of blessings, difficulties and labors, persecutions of creatures, and the separation from my parents and from all men. In the midst of these various trials, the Lord did not forget my weakness, for with the sorrow for the death of my mother, Holy Anne, he combined the consolation and comfort of permitting me to be present at her death. O oh, my soul, how many blessings do men lose by not attaining to this wisdom? They hold themselves aloof from the divine providence, which is powerful and sweet and unfailing, which measure, measures the orbs of heaven and the elements, which counts the footsteps, discerns the thoughts, and disposes everything for the benefit of the creatures. Instead of all this, men are given over to their own solicitudes, which are inefficient and weak, blind, uncertain, and inconsiderate. From this false beginning originate and follow irreparable evils for man, for he deprives himself of the divine protection and falls from the dignity of having his creator as his helper and defender. What is still worse, if by his carnal wisdom and by diabolical astuteness to which man resigns himself, he succeeds sometimes in obtaining what he seeks, he deems himself fortunate on account of this, his own misfortune. And with sensible pleasure he imbibes the poison of eternal death and the deceitful delight which he has gained while incurring the alienation and abhorrence of his God. Mind well, then, my daughter, this danger, and let thy whole solicitude be to cast thyself securely into the arms of thy provident God and Lord. He, being infinite in wisdom and power, loves thee much more than thou lovest thyself, and he knows and desires for thee greater goods than thou ever canst learn to desire and request. Confide in his goodness and in his promises, which do not admit of failure. Remember what he says through his prophet to the just, that it is well with man, Isaiah 3.10, since God takes upon himself his desires and cares and charges himself with them in order to deal with them according to his generosity. By means of this most secure confidence, thou wilt even in this mortal life enjoy the blessedness of a tranquil and peaceful conscience. And although thou mayest find thyself surrounded by the tempestuous waves of trial and adversity, which cast over thee the sorrows of death, Psalm 17, 5, and although the terrors of hell may surround thee, suffer thou and hope in patience, so that thou err not from the portal of the grace and the good will of the Most High. The Most High manifests himself to his beloved Mary, our princess, by conferring on her an extraordinary favor. Already our heavenly princess felt that the day of the clear vision of the divinity was approaching, and that like the harbingers of early dawn, the rays of the divine light were breaking upon her soul. Her heart began to be inflamed by the nearness of the invisible fire, which illumines but does not consume, and made attentive by this new clearness. She questioned her angels and said to them, quote, My friends and lords, my most faithful and vigilant sentinels, tell me, what hour is it of my night? And when will the bright light of the day arise, in which my eyes shall see the sun of justice which illumines them and gives life to my affections and my soul? Unquote. The holy princess, princes answered her and said, quote, Spouse of the Most High, thy wish for light and truth is near. It will not tarry long, for already it approaches. Unquote. At these words, the veil which hid the view of these spiritual substances was slightly lifted, and the holy angels became visible, showing themselves as during her first years in their own essence, without hindrance or dependence of the bodily senses. With these hopes and with the vision 
of the heavenly spirits, the anxieties of Most Holy Mary concerning the sight of her beloved were somewhat allayed. But this kind of love seeks after the most noble object, and without it, although enjoying the presence of the angels and saints, the heart, wounded by the arrows of the Omnipotent, will not come to rest. Nevertheless, our heavenly princess, rejoiced by this alleviation, spoke to her angels and said to them, quote, Sovereign princes, and flames of that inaccessible light in which my beloved dwells, why have I for so long a time been unworthy of your sight? Wherein have I been displeasing to you and failed to satisfy you? Tell me, my lords and teachers, wherein I have been negligent in order that I may not again be forsaken by you through my own fault, unquote. And they said, O late, quote, O lady and spouse of the Almighty, they answered, we, obtain, we obey the voice of the Creator and are governed by His holy will, and as His spirits, He commissions us and sends us out into His service. He commanded us to conceal ourselves during the time in which He Himself withdrew from sight. But though hidden, we remained present, solicitous for Thy protection and defense, fulfilling His command by remaining in Thy company without being visible. Unquote. She said, quote, Tell me then, where is my Lord at the present time, my highest good and my Maker? Tell me whether my eyes shall see him soon, or whether perhaps I have displeased him, in order that I may, as a most insignificant creature, bitterly bewail the cause of this punishment. Ministers and ambassadors of the highest King, be moved by my afflicted love, and give me tokens of my beloved. Unquote. The angels, quote, Soon, O lady, they answered. Thou shalt see him, whom thy soul desires. Let thy sweet sorrows turn to hope. Our God will not withhold himself from those who seek him so truly. Great, O mistress, is his loving goodness with all those that cling to him, and he will not be niggardly in satisfying thy wishes. Unquote. The holy angels openly called her mistress, as they were sure of her most prudent humility, and as they could, con and as they could conceal the full me meaning of this title under pretense of her position as spouse of the Most High. For she knew that they had been eyewitnesses of, her, of the espousal, which his majesty had celebrated with their queen. And as his wisdom had ordained, that in all else, except in the title and dignity of Mother of the Word, which was to remain concealed to her until the proper time, the holy angels were to show her great reverence, so they were solicitous to give her many tokens of respect, although they covertly honored her much more for what they knew in secret than for that which they manifested to her openly. <clears throat> During these conferences and loving colloquies, the heavenly princess awaited the approach of her spouse and her highest delight, while the seraphim, who attended her, commenced to prepare her by new enlightenment of her faculties, a sure pledge of the beginning of the good for which she hoped. But as these favors augmented the fire of her love without allowing her as yet to reach the desired end, they only augmented the heart-rending anguish of her love, and with sighs she spoke to the seraphim, saying, quote, most exalted spirits who stand close to my highest good, ye clear mirrors, whence reflected I was wont to see him in the joy of my soul. Tell me, where is the light which illuminates you and fills you with beauty? Tell me, why does my beloved tarry so long? Tell me what hides him and why my eyes cannot see him. If it is through my fault, I will amend my ways. If I do not merit the fulfillment of my wishes, I will conform myself to his will. And if he seeks his pleasure in my sorrow, I will suffer in the joy of my heart. But tell me, how can I live without having my own life? How shall I direct myself without light? Unquote. To her sweet complaints, the holy seraphim, seraphim answered, quote, Lady, thy beloved is not absent when for thy good he tarries and withholds himself. In order to console his beloved, he afflicts them. In order to give... In order to give so much the more joy, he aggrieves them. In order to be sought after, he withdraws from them. He wishes that thou sow in tears, Psalm 125, 5, and so gather afterwards the secret fruits of sorrow. If the beloved did not hide himself, he would not be sought after with that anxiety which is caused by his absence, nor would the soul renew its affections, nor increase in the appreciation due to that treasure." Unquote. They transmitted to her that light of which I have spoken, num, uh, of which I have spoken, in order to purify her faculties, not because there were any defects to be remedied, for she could not be guilty of any defects. On the contrary, all her actions and operations during the absence of the Lord had been mer meritorious and holy. 
Nevertheless, it was necessary that she be endowed with new gifts in order to tranquilize her spirit and her faculties, which had been moved by affectionate labors and anxieties during the absence of the Lord, and also in order to withdraw her from her present state and raise her to a position where she could enjoy new and different favors, for in order that her faculties might again be proportioned to the high object and to the manner of enjoying it, they most necessarily be, be renewed and redisposed. All this the holy seraphim proceeded to do with her in the manner already described in Book 2, Chapter 14, when the Lord conferred upon her the, the final adornment and the quality necessary for the immediate vision about to take place. As far as I can explain, the successive elevation of the faculties of the Heavenly Queen engendered those particular affections and sentiments of love and virtues which the Lord desired, and in the midst of these elevations His Majesty withdrew the veil. Then, after His long concealment, He manifested Himself to His only spouse, His beloved and most holy Mary, by an abstractive vision of the divinity. Although this vision was given through abstractive images and not intuitive, yet it was most clear and exalted in its kind. By it the Lord dried the continual tears of our Queen, rewarded her affection and her loving anxiety, satisfied all her desires, and overwhelmed her with delight as she reclined in the arms of her beloved. Canticles 8, 5 Then she was renewed, the youth of that aspiring eagle, winging its flight into the impenetrable regions of the divinity. Psalm 102, 5. And by the after effects of this vision, she ascended whither no other creature can ascend, or no other intellect can reach outside of God's. The joy which filled the most pure mistress on the occasion of this vision must be measured as well by the extreme sorrow through which she had passed as by the accumulation of merits which she had gained. I can only say that, in so far, and by how much sorrow had abounded, so also now overflowed her joy and that her patience, her humility, her fortitude, her constancy, her loving anxieties were the most remarkable and the most exquisite that ever until that time or even after could have existed or can exist in any creature. This most unparalleled lady alone could understand the excellence of that wisdom and could appreciate the greatness of the loss sustained in being deprived of the vision of God and in being far from His presence. She alone, having suffered and measured this great loss in humility, and with fortitude, to make it conductive to her sanctification by ineffable love, and afterwards to appreciate the blessings and joy of its recovery. Being then elevated to this vision, and having prostrated herself in the Divine Presence, the Most Holy Mary said to His Majesty, quote, Lord and Most High God, incomprehensible and highest good of my soul, since Thou raisest up such a poor and worthless worm as myself, receive, O Lord, in humble thankfulness of my soul, the homage due from me, to thy goodness and glory, together with that which thy courtiers render unto thee. And if any of the service which came from me, so low an earthly creature, has displeased thee, reform that which in my works has been unsatisfactory to thee, my Lord. O goodness and wisdom, incomparable and infinite, purify my heart and renew it, in order that it may be pleasing, humble, penitent, and acceptable in thy sight. If I have not borne the insignificant troubles and the death of my parents as I should, and if I have in anything erred from that which is pleasing to thee, perfect my faculties and all my works. O most high God, as my powerful Lord, as my Father, and as the only spouse of my soul. Unquote. To this humble prayer the most high answer, quote, My spouse and my dove, the grief for the death of thy parents and the sorrow occasioned by the other troubles in this na is the natural effect of human nature, and no fault and by the love with which thou hast conformed thyself to the dispositions of my providence in all things, thou hast merited anew my graces and my blessings. I am the one that distributes the true light and its effects by my wisdom. I am the Lord of all, that calls forth the day and the night in succession. I cause tranquility, and I set bounds on the storms, in order that my power and my glory may be exalted, and in order that through them the soul might steer more securely with the ballast of experience and hasten, more expediently. Well. Expediously. Through the violent waves of tribulation, arriving at the secure harbor of my friendship and grace, and obliging me by the fullness of merit to receive it with so much the greater favor. 
This, my beloved, is the admirable course of my wisdom, and for this reason I concealed myself during all that time from thy sight. From, from them I seek whatever is most holy and most perfect. Serve me then, my beautiful one, who am thy spouse, thy God of infinite mercy, and whose name is admirable in the diversity and variety of my great works." Unquote. Our princess issued from this vision altogether renovated and made godlike, full of the new science of the divinity and of the hidden sacraments of the king, confessing him, adoring him, and praising him with incessant canticles and by the flights of her pacified and tranquilized spirit. In like proportion also was the increase of her humility and of all the other virtues. Her most ardent prayer was to penetrate more and more deeply into that which is most perfect and most pleasing to the will of the Most High, and to fulfill and execute it in, in her actions. Thus passed a number of days until that happened, which is to be related in the next chapter. Instruction given me by the Queen of Heaven, our Mistress. My daughter, many times I shall repeat to thee the lesson containing the greatest wisdom for souls, which consists in the knowledge of the cross, in the love of sufferings, and in putting this knowledge into practice by bearing afflictions with patience. If the condition of mortals were not so low, they would covet sufferings merely for the sake of their God and Lord, who has proclaimed them to be according to his will and pleasure. For the faithful and loving servant should always prefer the likings of his Lord to his own convenience. But the worldlings in their torpidity are moved neither by the duty of conforming to their Father and Lord, nor by his declarations that all their salvation consists in following Christ and his sufferings, and that his sinful children must reap the fruit of the redemption by imitation of their sinless chief. Accept then, my dearest, this doctrine and engrave it deeply in thy heart. Understand that as a daughter of the Most High, as the spouse of my son, and as my disciple, even if from no other motive, thou must acquire the precious gem of suffering, and thus become pleasing to thy Lord and spouse. I exhort thee, my daughter, to select the sufferings of his cross in preference to his favors and gifts, and rather embrace afflictions than desire to be visited with caresses. For in choosing favors and delights thou mayest be moved by self-love, but in accepting tribulations and sorrows thou canst be moved only by the love of Christ. And if preference is to be given to, the, to sufferings rather than to delights, Wherever it can be done without sin, what foolishness it is when men pursue so blindly the deceitful and vile delights of the senses, and when they abhor so much all, all that pertains to suffering for Christ and for the good of their own soul. Thy incessant prayer, my daughter, should be always to repeat, Here I am, Lord, what wilt thou do with me? Prepare, prepared is my heart, I am ready and not disturbed. What dost thou wish me to do for thee? These sentiments should fill thy heart in their full and true import, repeating them more by sincere and ardent affection than by word of mouth. Let thy thoughts be exalted, thy intentions most upright, pure and noble, desiring to fulfill in all things the greater pleasure of the Lord, who with measure and weight dispenses both sufferings and the favors of his graces. Examine and search within thyself without ceasing, by what sentiments, by what actions, and in what occasion thou mayest guard against offenses, and in what thou canst please thy beloved most perfectly, and thus learn what thou must strive to correct, or what thou must aspire to, with, to within thyself. Every disorder, be it yet so small, and all that may be less pure and perfect, see thou curtail and expunge immediately, even though it seem allowable, or even of some profit. All that is not most pleasing to thy Lord, thou must consider as evil, or as useless for thyself, and no imperfection must appear small to thee, if it is displeasing to God. With this anxious fear and holy solicitude, thou shalt walk securely, and be certain, my dearest daughter, that it cannot enter into the mind of man what copious reward the Most High Lord reserves for those souls that live in this kind of attention and solicitude. The Most High commands the Most Holy Mary to enter the state of matrimony and her response to this command. At the age of thirteen and a half years, having grown considerably for her age, our most charming princess, most pure Mary, had another abstracted vision of the divinity of the same order and kind as those already described. In this vision, we might say, happened something similar to that which the Holy Scriptures relate of Abraham when God commanded him to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac, the only pledge of all his hopes. 
God tempted Abraham, says Moses, Genesis 12, 2, trying and probing the promptness of his obedience in order to reward it. We can say the same thing of our great lady, that God tried her in this vision by commanding her to enter the state of matrimony. Thence we can also understand the truth of the words, how inscrutable are the judgments of the Lord, and how exalted are his ways and thoughts above our own. Romans 11.33 As distant as heaven is from earth were the thoughts of Most Holy Mary from the plans which the Most High now made known to her by commanding her to accept a husband for her protection and company. For as far as depended upon her, she, would, she had desired and resolved during all her life not to have a husband. And she had often repeated and renewed the vow of chastity which she had taken at such a premature age. As, our, as already mentioned, the Lord had celebrated his solemn espousal with the Princess Mary when she was brought to the temple, confirming and approving her vow of chastity. <clears throat> and so, solemni solemnizing it by the presence of the glorious host of angels, the most innocent dove had withdrawn herself from all human intercourse, rel relinquishing entirely all that might be called worldly interest and attention, or love and desire of creatures. She was altogether taken up and transformed by the pure and chaste love of the highest good, which never fails, knowing that she would be only more chaste in its love, more pure in its contact, and more virginal in its acceptance. When, therefore, without any other explanation, the command of the Lord reached her, that she now accept an earthly spouse and husband, what surprise and astonishment was it to this heavenly maid, who, in her fixed confidence, was living so secure in the possession of God himself as her spouse, and who now heard from him such a command. Greater was this trial than that of Abraham, Genesis 22, 1, etc., for he did not love Isaac in the same degree as most holy Mary loved in violet chastity. Nevertheless, at this unexpected command, the most prudent virgin suspended her judgment and preserved the calmness of her hope and belief more perfectly than Abraham. Hoping against hope, Romans 4.18, she made answer to the Lord, saying, quote, Eternal God and incomprehensible majesty, creator of heaven and earth and of all things contained therein, thou, O Lord, who weighest the winds, Job 28.25, and by thy commands settest bounds to the sea and subjectest, subjectest all creation to thy will, canst dispose of me, thy worthless wormlet, according to thy pleasure, without making me fail in that which I have promised to thee. And if it be not displeasing to thee, my good Lord, I confirm and ratify anew my desire to remain chaste during all my life, and to have thee for my Lord and spouse. And since my only duty as a creature is to obey thee, and since my uh, see thou to it, my spouse, that according to thy providence, I may escape from this predicament in which thy holy love places me." Unquote. There was, however, some uneasiness in the most chaste maiden, Mary, as far as her inferior nature was concerned, just as happened afterwards at the message of the archangel Gabriel, Luke 1, 8. Yet though she felt some sadness, it did not hinder her from practicing the most heroic obedience which until then had fallen to her lot, and she resigned herself entirely into the hand of the Lord. His majesty answered her, quote, Mary, let not thy heart be disturbed, for thy resignation is acceptable to me, and my powerful arm is not subject to laws. By my disposition that will happen, which is most proper for thee." Unquote. Consoled only by this vague promise of the Lord, Most Holy Mary recovered from her vision and returned to her ordinary state. Left between doubt and hope by the divine command and promise, she was full of solicitude, for the Lord intended that she should multiply her tearful sentiments of love and confidence of faith, humility, of obedience, of purest chastity, and of other virtues, impossible to enumerate. In the meantime, while our great lady applied herself to vigilant prayer and to her resigned and prudent sighs and solicitude, God spoke in sleep to the high priest, St. Simeon, and commanded him to arrange for the marriage of Mary, the daughter of Joachim and Anne of Nazareth, since he regarded her with special care and love. The holy priest answered, asking what was his will in regard to the person whom the maiden Mary was to marry and to whom she was to give herself as spouse. The Lord instructed him to call together the other priests and learn persons and to tell them that this maiden was left alone and an orphan and that she did not desire to be married, but that, as it was a custom for the firstborn maidens not to leave the temple without being provided for, it was proper she should be married to whomever it seemed good to them. 
And that's where I'll stop for this evening. All praise and glory be to our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless and keep you.